and namaste everyone to this channel called Susanna Reacts, where I learn all about India with your help. And I just share my point of view as I as I go along as someone from Central uh, Europe, Slovakia. And in today's video, I'm super excited because we're going to explore temples in Kashmir. So there, are, there would be the ancient temples. And um, I really love history. In fact, I studied history in, in more like a just so you are aware it was not like I'm a like a historian I could say I'm a historian but I don't feel like I am one I'm just like a teacher of history so and obviously as we know history is uh, written by certain people and um, and tweak tweaked so we all have different records of what we want to do and I'll just try to share my screen I'm just so super excited to to watch this video with you and without further ado let's kick off kashmir the name itself invokes a lot of geopolitical and religious thoughts and views and opinions but putting all that aside getting straight to the point what has been the real history of kashmir a brutally honest and undisputable account about the ancient history and heritage of kashmir that's what you're going to see in the next couple of minutes Let's get straight to the topic. If we dig deep into the archives of the British occupied India, almost like 150 years ago, back then, the British authorities, through the Archaeological Survey of India, they conducted a survey, a survey about Kashmir, the ancient buildings and the temples in this region. The British did a very detailed examination of all these temples, which were destroyed as part of the Islamic invasions. And they tried to reconstruct the plans, the drawings, and then the photographs of them. And then they compiled it in a book called as Ancient Buildings in Kashmir, published in 1869. That's approximately 150 years ago from now. And with these archives as our primary source, let us try to understand all the lost temples of ancient Kashmir. They say that a picture speaks a thousand words. The pictures of the ancient temples that you're going to see as part of this documentary in the next couple of minutes, they speak not just thousand words, but a million words. So I want to do this documentary a little differently. I don't want to talk much. and Let the pictures do all the talking. So let's get started. Just a quick note to start with. The photographs that you're going to see in this documentary about the ancient temples of Kashmir are the photographs taken by the British authorities back in 1868. So the shape and form of these temples and the state of them today might be a lot different from what it was 150 years ago, what you're going to see in this documentary. So the first temple is Meruvardhana Swami, built by Amatya Meru, dedicated to Lord Shiva. Location, Pandrethan. Pandrethan is a distorted pronunciation of the original name Purana Adhisthan, which means the old capital, Kashmir. Built in the period of 913 to 921 CE. That is 1100 plus years old. So this temple was in ruins when British was doing the archaeological survey around this temple. Number two, Sugandheswara. Built by King Shankaravarman of Utpala dynasty. Location, Pathan, Kashmir. Period, 883 to 901 CE. Why do I know Pathan? Seems familiar. Shankaravarman built the temple dedicated to Lord Shiva in the name of his wife, Sugandhi. Thus, the name Sugandheswara. Kalhana's Rajatarangini about all the dynasties in Kashmir is the primary account of all this information. And this temple is also desecrated and destroyed as part of the Islamic invasions of Kashmir. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Number three, Bhavani Mandir. Dedicated to Ma Parvati. It is not known who built this temple, but interestingly, around 1200 years ago, this temple was unearthed in Kashmir by the king of those times. Location, Boniar, Kashmir. Number 4. Avanti Swami Temple. Built by King Avanti Varman. Location, Avantipur, Kashmir. Period, 850 to 854 CE. Number 5. Shankara Gaureshwara. Again, built by Shankara Varman of Utpala dynasty. The same king who built Sugandheshwara. 
he built two temples one in the name of his wife sugandheshwara dedicated to lord shiva and another temple as shankara gaureshwara again dedicated to lord shiva and parvati in his name shankara varman hence shankara gaureshwara location pathan kashmir period 1883 to 901 ce okay. number 6 jeshteshwara again this temple we don't know who built it but the dating of this temple is 220 to 223 bce that's approximately 2200 years old and this temple is the oldest in the entire kashmir dedicated to lord shiva and as usually desecrated and destroyed but now thankfully mm-hmm. it is restored okay. number 7 martand sun temple dedicated to surya bhagwan built by ranaditya varma location anantnag kashmir period 490 to 555 ce that's more than 1500 years old number 8 sharada shakti peet we don't know who built it the location is in neelam pakistan occupied kashmir and the period as well is unknown but the antiquity of sharada shakti peet is incredible it is even mentioned innumerable times in the puranas as well so that speaks for itself mm-hmm. number 9 wangad temple complex a group of temples in this area wangad kashmir we don't know who built it and when it was built but as part of the archaeological survey that british did it has already been in ruins terribly desecrated and destroyed okay. number 10 wow. naranag mandir location naranag kashmir again built by unknown period 220 bce that's approximately 2200 years ago It's interesting how they mention like BCE. I just had to Google what the 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 CE man common era like we don't usually refer to it like that. We 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 say like before Christ or BE. Yeah. BC. The list is never ending, but this is what truth looks like. Mm-hmm. This is what hatred towards other cultures and other religions look like. And this is what the damage that islamic invasions have inflicted on kashmir would look like mm-hmm. and this is what history would look like and if we really want to correct our history textbooks it cannot be done by just removing certain chapters on the invasions rather it's all about including the truth and this is what the real truth is and i said a picture speaks a thousand words but these pictures speak a million words i rest my case If you are of the opinion that bro something has happened over a thousand years fine let's get over it let's talk about development progressiveness diversity inclusion etc etc so let me tell you one thing straight bharat has been a very diverse civilization all along it has been a pluralistic civilization all along and that is the reason you will not have as diverse country as bharat be it in terms of language religion etc Of course we have this disease of caste based discrimination let's talk about it in a separate form but coming to the current context so let's take a small instance i think everything would be clarified if you just think about that one instance take two people number one is general dyer who unleashed the massacre of chellian walabag and number two is aurangzeb talking about general dyer no one looks at general dyer as a catholic or a christian he has been a brutal he was a monster who unleashed chellian walabag now you talk about aurangzeb that invokes a lot of political and religious emotions even today I'm not saying across the board but it has reasonable political relevance and political convenience why i want you to think about just this one question compare general dyer and aurangzeb general dyer does not have any political relevance while aurangzeb is still having political relevance in indian politics why a common sensical mm-hmm. question ask for yourself and try to find an answer for yourself Having said that, are we against any specific religion? Absolutely no, and that's not a motherhood statement. And I mean it. I don't care which religion you follow. You don't care which religion I follow. You and me should peacefully coexist in the society. That's all. This true God, false God, heaven, hell, believer, non-believer, these things should not disturb the harmony in the society. And unfortunately, a thousand-year-long reality is otherwise.
I don't want to conclude the history about Kashmir on a negative note or a victimhood note. So let's turn around and understand the greatness of Kashmir in just two minutes. Ustamito vanastha Kashmir pradeshe prasiddho murugakya ha. These words are said by Vasista Maharshi, Guru of Bhagavan Sri Ram, while writing Dhanurvedam, which is part of Yajurvedam. Vasista Maharshi refers to a species of deer that is exclusively present in the region of Kashmir. Kashmir Pradeshe Prasiddhau. And Vasista Maharshi goes on explaining how to make a bow with the horns of this deer, which is indigenous to the region of Kashmir. The word Kashmir and this region has a very deep antiquity, all the way back to the times of Vedas, still being called exactly with the same name, Kashmir. Hmm. Indians invented zero. The same boring dialogue on and on and on you get to hear all the time. But how many of us are really aware of the Bhakshali Sarada manuscript? This is the oldest written record about Bharatiya Ganitam in first hand. It is approximately 1800 to 2000 years old. And this Bhakshali Sharada manuscript accidentally found an excavation and is written in a script native to Kashmir. And it explains the Bharati Yaganitam or the Indian mathematics in a practical yeah. and a detailed manner. I made a detailed documentary on Bhakshali manuscript. You can check that if you're interested. But getting to the topic, let me pull out a very interesting fact in our current context. We use symbols for arithmetic operators, right? Plus, minus, so on and so forth. Yeah. So when was this culture of using symbols ah. for denoting an arithmetic operation came into so existence? Cool. So these are very interesting basic questions that opens up. Yeah, and one would think it would be from Greece. And I'm aware that Greece did not invent zero. It was um, in India. So, wow. A world of a different kind of research, I would say. It has been a very fascinating journey for me all along. And here is... A, a small fact that I would like to share with you. As part of Bakshali manuscript, how two numbers are subtracted was explained. Don't get carried away by the plus symbol that you're seeing. It is not addition. Rather, it is subtraction. And this plus okay. is not a plus. It is a Samskritam letter Ka. And the meaning of this Samskritam letter Ka is to reduce. So that is the reason. 3 Ka 8. That means 3 minus 8. That's equal to 5. Interestingly, the arithmetic operation of subtraction was flipped the other way around as part of this Bhakshali Sarada manuscript. And this manuscript is the oldest written record in the whole world for also the usage of zero in calculations. It's a fascinating subject altogether. Written in the script called Sharada. The script what you're seeing on the screen is called as Sharada. Kashmir also holds this incredible heritage when it comes to linguistics. Samskritam has always been named after Goddess Saraswati. The oldest known script of Samskritam is called as Brahmi, a name of Saraswati Devi. And the next generation of the script which evolved from Brahmi is Siddhamatrika, again name of Saraswati Devi. And from Siddhamatrika came Sharada script, what you're seeing on the screen, also in the name of Saraswati Devi. The reason I quoted about Dhanurvedam and Bhakshali Sharada manuscript is both these facts quickly establish how deep the antiquity of Kashmir has been and how rich the scientific heritage of Kashmir has been. We did not even scratch the surface. But if we get to the depth of how Kashmir has been the highest seat of knowledge in Bharat, that line of research opens up certain fascinating aspects about the greatness of Bharat. That's very interesting because, you know, even with the Kashmir conflicts, uh, I was always wondering why is that region so important? Like, I now understand the history behind that, but like what he's like getting on to, I, I feel like there may be some other significance to Kashmir. If you do know, let me know, point me to the right videos. I, I would love to know because it feels that there is perhaps something more in um, the, the, the recorded knowledge and it was very interesting to learn about the temples and I think as he has mentioned uh, it's it's important to acknowledge what has happened and uh, I mean you guys have incredible temples and incredible heritage so which is great I, I just do think it's important to recognize it and move on and, and focus on you know how to perhaps live uh, live a better life but let's carry on so that is the most unbiased and undisputable account about the lost temples of our ancient 
Kashmir. And let me get this straight and blunt one more time. If I destroy and desecrate the holy places of another religion, then there is nothing holy about my religion to start with. And most importantly, the truth should never be subverted, no matter for political convenience or for any other material reasons. The truth stands high above all of us. Concluding it in the words of Swami Vivekananda, here is what he says. Truth does not pay homage to any society, ancient or modern. Society has to pay homage to truth or die. Societies should be molded upon truth and truth has not to adjust itself to society. That is the bottom line. And as always, thanks for watching. Well, I mean, he's, he's right, fair enough. Uh, but we all know that the history has been twisted to serve certain narratives. Uh, I, I can tell that this, uh, this has happened uh, with India. This has happened multiple times with Slovakia. And I guess there is not, I don't know, I don't want to say not much we can do. I mean, we can, we can discuss and we can... Um, build upon it. Um, we actually had, interestingly enough, um, because Slovak people do not really what you would call, like, I, I feel like you guys are very proud uh, to be Indians, but in Slovakia, I don't feel like people are proud to be Slovaks at all. And I think that this uh, largely to the lack of um, lack of, you know, the, the kind of history. But I think the big part of that is that also there, there, there are stream of thoughts, and I've had this conversation with friends of mine, like they're saying like the national identity is bullshit, literally, I'll just use that word. And they don't care because we're all citizens of the world. Why does it matter where you're from? You can look at it, 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 it from various angles, right? But I feel like um, um, for building of the nation, I can clearly see it from your comments as well that uh, India has obviously lived its 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 trauma, and uh, I feel like it's 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 important when you're rebuilding as a country to to draw on your strengths and and your um, great achievements from the past, right? So to to rebuild your confidence, etc. And I feel like without that, it's very hard to build a nation. In fact, it's it's almost like a national identity in Maslow's hierarchy, right? Like first, you need to have a certain needs to be met, and perhaps it's just the the kind of need to establish that you know we are significant, that we have achieved something before maybe you can let go of that concept. But I think obviously there is a I don't want to say higher. I'm not too sure I can find the right word, but it's also different. Maybe is the way to look at it because all in all, like we're we're all one. We're all connected. Why does it matter where we're from, right? But at the same time, we have to live in our uh, material universe and and observe and 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 see what's happening here. So I guess as always, it's about universal balance. And with that. I will leave you and I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, please give it a thumbs up, share, subscribe to this channel and I hope to see you in the next one. Until then, you take care. Much love. Bye-bye.